From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Hello, Mr. Dollar. This is Dr. Carr. Yes? Sergeant Wright had to go back to his office and asked if I would call you. Oh, I get it now. The Boldrick shooting. Sorry, I understood Dr. Stone was on the case. We've both been attending Boldrick. What's his condition now, Doctor? He's improved some, but he'll be lucky to live. We gave him three blood transfusions this afternoon. And this evening, he regained consciousness. Was Sergeant Wright there at that time? Yes. What did Boldrick say? Did he say who shot him? No, he wouldn't talk about it. Said he didn't remember, but he was lucid when he arrived. Oh. When do you think I can see him? Well, that's why I called, Mr. Dollar. You can see him this evening. Sergeant Wright hopes that since you aren't a police officer, perhaps Boldrick will talk to you. Well, I can try. I'll be there in about 45 minutes. Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Corinthian All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Arthur Boldrick matter. Expense account item one, $2.30 cab fare from my apartment to the emergency hospital. I wouldn't stay with him too long, Dollar. Doctor. All right, Just Doctor. a few minutes. You'll be able to tell when he tires. This is the room. Well, Boldrick, how are you feeling now? I don't know. You're coming along fine. This is Mr. Dollar. He represents your insurance company. Hello, Baldrick. Sorry about what happened. Yeah. Mr. Dollar wants to ask you a few questions. I've told him not to stay too long, but if you feel tired, you can tell him to leave. I'll drop by and see you later. You think I'm going to die? Is that why you're here? Oh, of course not. Doctor told me you were out of danger. I've just got some routine questions to ask you. you say it was a man that shot you? Yeah. Somebody I never saw before, that I can remember. But I don't know what happened. You remember where you were when you were shot? It was in the backyard near the garage. I was right by the garage door, and this guy come around from the alley and... What did he say to you? He was after the car keys. I had them in my hand. He for me to grab them for me. He said, give me those keys or something like that, and I... I gave him a push, and that's when he shot me. After then, I, I didn't even know he had a gun. You didn't see it when he asked for the keys? No, if I'd have saw it, he could have had the keys. I, I don't fight no man with a gun. What did he look like? Well, that's, that's one of the things I don't remember too good. It happened so fast. He, he was wearing, like, overalls or something. What color? Well, blue. It seems like only faded. Could have been shirt and pants, too. It was, it was awful fast. There he was, and then it happened. What else about him? That's about all. I, I think he was sort of dark, but I don't think I'd even know him for sure if I saw him again. Maybe I would. Maybe you'll remember more if you try. I will. I I figured this guy, whoever he was, was in trouble or something, and he just needed a car in a hurry. But he didn't take the keys. Well, I figured he lost his nerve. Wilma came running out when she heard the noise. Will Wheeler from next door. This guy was gone when they got to me. Well, I won't bother you any longer, Boldrick. You will help find this man if you'll think about it as much as you can and try to remember what he looked like. Oh, don't worry, I will. Hey, Mr. D, you think they'll let my wife come to see me tonight? I'd sure like to see her. I don't know. Well, I'll ask Dr. Carf on the way out. I'll see you later, Boulder. I made my report to the sergeant, and the search was started for a dark man dressed in a faded blue work clothes and possibly armed with a 25 caliber pistol or revolver. It was only 7 o'clock, barely dusk, so I cabbed out to the Boldrick address. It was a single-story, run-down house in the neighborhood we Hartfordians choose to call an older part of town rather than a slum. His wife was a work-worn woman who looked older than her 34 years. She led me into the backyard and showed me the garage that faced on an alley and the spot still stained where her husband had lain. You were here. Nobody was in sight when you got out here? 
Mm-mm. I didn't see nobody. Neither did Will Wheeler. Your husband mentioned him. He lives next door? Yeah, that house. And this man must have run down the alley. Does it open onto a street at both ends of the block? Yeah. It runs clear down to Lawrence and up to about Cedar the other way. I should think that most of the people in the neighborhood would be home at that time, the time he was shot, wouldn't you? I should think so, yeah. And the police will probably find somebody who saw this man running down the alley. I think somebody saw him. But most people... Is everything all right? Yeah, Will. It's all right. Well, he's bothering you and you don't feel like it. Just tell me. It's all right, Will. He's from the insurance. My name is Dollar. You must be Mr. Wheeler. That's right. I don't think nobody ought to be bothering Velma in the middle of all this trouble. I wanted to meet her and ask a few questions. That's all I'm through. All right, then go on in the house, Velma. Try and get some rest. If it's all right, then. Sure, Mrs. Bogey. Thanks very much. All right. I guess I couldn't help very much. This has got her in pretty bad shape, finding art like that. And then they won't let her go and see him. How is he, do you know? Pretty bad. I saw him a little while ago. Was he making sense? Seemed to be. Before the ambulance picked him up, he was kind of off. All he could say was some guy shot him, but he didn't know. Something about the car keys. But he told me, too. Yeah, this is a rotten neighborhood. It's full of rotten people. He isn't going to die, is he? They don't know. You didn't tell Velma that, did you? No, but I think somebody should before she reads it in the papers. One of the dangers is a wound he got in the last war. Oh, yeah, in the lung. Two slugs he took this afternoon may take care of the other one. Oh. I didn't think it was as bad as that. But I guess I'd better tell her. I've been a friend of Art's for a long time. Well, I'll see you later, Mr. Dollar. As I left the neighborhood, I noticed two police cars, so I knew Sergeant Wright's men were at work. I was in his office a little later when two of the men brought a witness in. This is Mr. Dollar, Mrs. Cole. How do you do? Mrs. Cole. It was nice of you to come in. I thought it was my duty. The other policeman wanted to know if I was in my backyard near the alley when there was that shooting, and I was. How far from the Bolrick house do you live, Mrs. Cole? Well, there's two houses between theirs and where I live. Those policemen told me they were looking for somebody who saw a man running down the alley. I've got a garden out back, and that's where I was when I heard the shots. I didn't see no man running, but I saw a car come from that way. Which way do you live from the Baldricks, Mrs. Cole? Down from them. South, that is. And did you recognize this car? No, I didn't. I didn't see the man in it either, but it came from that way. Did you see anybody else in the alley at the time? No. At first, after I saw the car, I thought it was backfired. But then when I heard about the trouble, I remembered the car. Well, we're glad you did, Mrs. Cole. Is the car traveling fast or slow, would you say? Oh, about medium, I'd say. They can't go too fast in the alley on account of the chuck holes. What color was it? Tan or brown. I don't know much about what kind it could be. I think you could call it a sedan. Anything else, Dollar? Not right now. The officers uh, you came in with will want to ask you a few more questions, and then they'll drive you home, Mrs. Cole. No. I want to thank you very much. Well, I hope I've been some help. Good night, Mrs. Cole. Good night. Nothing fits, Dollar. Three witnesses on the other side of Baldrick's place swear they would have seen anybody running in the alley at that time. And this one says she saw a car leaving. Oh, it's still early. I guess we'd better phone the hospital, find out if we can see him. Huh? Yeah. Yep. I'll put out an alarm on a brown or tan sedan, and then I'll call. <laughs> Baldrick. How are you feeling now? Not so good. How come they tell me I'm not strong enough to see my wife and then they let you guys come in? I want to see her. We'll only be a few minutes. We thought you'd like to know what they found out about the shooting. Sure I would. What? Well, enough to make us wonder if you're telling the truth about what happened. I don't get you. Three witnesses who live in your block say that a man didn't run down the alley after the shooting. Well, I can't help what they said, can I? But another witness said she saw a car drive away. The more people we question, Baldrick, the less possible it seems that this man you talk about could have shot you. 
They'd have no reason to lie, so we've come back to you. You haven't been telling the truth, have you? Why should I do anything else? What about this car that drove away? I didn't see any car. I, I don't know anything about now, it. Now, look, you've been evasive about this from the beginning. You told me you couldn't remember, but you had time to think before Dollar got here. And you gave him the story about this man. We think you're protecting whoever shot you, Goldrick. That's crazy. We want you to tell us who it was. I can't tell you. I, I don't know. You won't tell us who was in the car? Leave me alone. <laughs> All right, Goldrick. If you want to protect whoever tried to kill you, I guess it's your business. But we'll learn who it was. Wait a minute. I deserve to get it. That don't make any difference to you, but it does to me. <laughs> I don't want to hurt anybody anymore. That's why I won't tell you. Now, take it easy, Boulder. There was only one way to stop me from hurting people. What were you doing? My ex-wife. You were still seeing her? I guess there was only one way to stop me. I, I was hurting her husband, my wife, and my friend. <laughs> was her husband in the car, Baldrick? I think we better call the doctor. Was her husband in the car? Yes, but I don't want to hurt him anymore. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't have questioned him, huh? I'll call Dr. Carp. <laughs> return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Johnny Dollar's listening fans will want to make a special note of Johnny's time change beginning this coming Wednesday, June 20th, over most of these same CBS stations. Follow yours truly, Johnny Dollar, on his San Francisco search for a missing medico, a puzzling case Johnny calls the Malcolm Wish Matter. Enjoy it when you hear yours truly, Johnny Dollar, moving to Wednesday nights on CBS, starting on the 20th. Next Wednesday. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Without a Baldrick nearing the point of death, the next move was obvious. To bring in the man he had accused and arrange a formal identification and accusation. Sergeant Wright called two other officers to stand by the hospital and, in case we were too slow, get a deathbed statement. Then Wright and I left. The dying man's first wife, Anna, had married a man named Thomas Hood. We found their house in a slightly more desirable neighborhood, but not too far from where the Boldricks lived. Yes? Are you Mrs. Hood? Yes. Here you are. Here you are. Police. Is your husband at home? No, he's out of town. What's the matter? I think we'd better come in and talk to you then. What do you want with me? We want to talk to you about Arthur Boldrick. What did he do? He was shot this afternoon. Now may we come in? All right. This is Mr. Dollar. He's a private investigator. Mrs. Hood? Art is dead. No, but he's not expected to live. Why did you come here? We just left Boldrick a short time ago. He told us your husband shot him. Oh, no. No, he didn't. You said your husband was out of the city, Mrs. Hood. When did he leave? This afternoon. Why did he leave? He went on business. He's a salesman. He's out of town. He couldn't have shot him. What time did he leave? It was this afternoon. I think about four or so. He left this house about four? I think that's when it was. Baldrick was shot a little after 5.30, between then and a quarter to six. Is your husband's car a sedan or a coupe or what? A sedan. What color? Tan. A sedan driven by a man and described as brown or tan was seen leaving the alley near where Baldrick was shot. Huh? It was seen a few seconds after the shots were heard. No. No, no, he didn't do it. Better sit down, Mrs. Hood. Come on, sit down. He didn't shoot him. I swear he didn't. I swear. You mean he approved of your saying, Baldrick? He didn't. Who told you that? Baldrick. My husband didn't know. I know I was wrong. I shouldn't have seen him. That doesn't make any difference. Except my seeing him didn't have anything to do with whatever happened. Tom didn't shoot him because he didn't know about it. And he mustn't know. He mustn't find out. In spite of what you thought, it looks like he did know. Now, where is he, Mrs. Hood? We want to reach him tonight. I won't tell you. He didn't have anything to do with it. 
But I can't let him find out about Art and me. Mrs. Hood, according to the doctors, Baldrick won't live through the night. This is going to turn into a murder case. What we say to your husband about you isn't important in the least. Very few things are when it's murder. He didn't know. He didn't have anything to do with it. When do you expect to hear from him? I don't know. Sometimes he phones, but never the first day out. Usually the same. He'd have to stay out longer than he expected to. We'll have to have more than that. We'll get in touch with this company. I, I wish you'd listen to me once more. I tell you, Tom didn't do it. If you talk to him, all you're going to do is bust up our lives. That's all you're going to do. Then I guess that's what we'll have to do. You ready to go, Dollar? <laughs> we got back to the hospital, Arthur Boldrick was dead. He had made a deathbed statement, and again had named Thomas Hood as the man who had shot him. While Sergeant Wright went to work on locating him, I stopped by the Boldrick house. The next door neighbor, Will Wheeler. Yeah, I got a lot of drinks down there, and she finally went to sleep. I don't know what kind of shape she'd be in if you woke her up. I won't bother her then. Her husband died about an hour ago. Oh. Well, I sort of knew, I guess, after I talked to you this afternoon. We're old art. You're going to miss him. He had a lot of faults. Everybody knew about those, I guess. But there were a lot of good things about him, too. Hardly anybody knew about them. Is there any more on the guy that killed him? He changed his story. He finally told us Tom Hood had shot him. Tom Hood? And his husband? Yeah. Well, I don't get it. What? Well, he's holding the one story and then changing it. The first one didn't hold up. Police could find plenty of people who would have seen a man running away, but nobody that did. But a woman saw a car that checked with the one Hood drives. I guess you knew about Boldrake and his ex-wife. Yeah, but I still don't see why he told the first story and then changed it. I don't either. He said he deserved to get shot, that he hurt a lot of people, and there was no other way to stop him. He said he didn't want to hurt Hood anymore. And that's why he didn't say it was him. That's what I mean about the bad side of him and the good side. Did his wife know about Anna? I, I'm not sure. Since I never talked to her. I... Oh, you think he told that first story to keep her from finding out? It could be. The police will call her in the morning. When she hears about it, tell her there are some insurance papers for her to sign, will you? I'll leave them now. The next morning, when I phoned Sergeant Wright at 10, things stood pretty much the same. Thomas Hood hadn't been located. He supposedly had left for Boston, where he was expected to check into the Royce Hotel, but he never reached there. The Massachusetts police were alerted, and we were sure that part of it was covered. I got to Wright's office at 10.45, and at 11.30, we were thrown a curve. My name is Mantell. I read in the paper this morning about the shooting out north yesterday. Well? My friend said I was a fool for coming in to see you, but I work on radio repairs, and... And I delivered a set to some people in the next block that afternoon. What time did you deliver it, Mr. Mandel? Mm, about 5.30, a little after. I read how some woman saw a tan sedan going down that alley, and you were looking for it. Well, I'm pretty sure that was mine. You go through the alley? Uh, yeah, I did. You're sure of the time? You can ask the people who own the set. Their name is Olsen in the next block. And you followed the alley through the next block? Yes, I did. The same way that dame said. Did you hear the shots? No, but I think I know why. That alley is bumpy, and I got a few loose bolts in that car. It's pretty noisy. But the car that dame spotted was mine. I'm sure of that. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Mandel. That's very interesting information. It was interesting, especially in the face of Boldrick's deathbed statement. As far as we could see, Mr. Mandel had no reason to lie. Sergeant Wright and I went back over everything we had. When we'd finished, there were only a few points from which to start the investigation again. This is Sergeant Wright, Mr. Wheeler. I don't believe you've met. How do you do? I do. We hope Mrs. Boldrick is able to see us. Yeah, I think she's in pretty good shape. What, has anything new or developed? Well, we think so, Mr. Wheeler. Where's Mrs. Boldrick? Uh, she's here, in this way. I want to talk to you, Velma. This here is Sergeant... Uh... Sergeant Wright. How do you do? Hello, Mrs. Boldrick. We want to cover this as quickly as possible. You know that your husband accused Thomas Hood of shooting him? Will told me. It was an... Do you believe it? He said so. 
You knew about him and his ex-wife? No. Not till Will told me about what he said when he was dying. You sure of that? I... He never talked about Anna. Well, in spite of the fact that your husband accused Hood right up to the time he died, it looks like Hood didn't shoot him. I... Why would he say it? Must have been that he was trying to protect someone. But if you didn't know about him and Anna, he couldn't have been protecting you because you wouldn't have had any reason to kill your husband. So who do you think he was protecting, Mrs. Bullard? I don't know. Wait a minute. I told so many stories, I, I don't get it. The last one depended on a car. I told you about it. But it turned out not to be the one that Hood drove. What was the matter with it? Well, it looks like he was just trying too hard. Only one or two people could have really seen whoever killed Baldrick. We've covered the alley both ways. We've covered the houses across the alley where the killer could have slipped through. This house and yours, Wheeler, are the only ones we didn't bother to check. I can't do any more, no, Will. No, wait a minute. What's the matter? I can't do any more. All right. I'm all right. All right. It wasn't my idea. I went as far as I could. It was his idea. Was it you he was protecting, Mrs. Bolvick? Yes. It wasn't her fault. I... I mean, anyone would have done it. He's over too far. Because it's a man. Because of Anna. Yes. What else? She's as much to blame. I couldn't stay away from her, but she could have made him. And yesterday, with her husband out of town, it reached a peak. We all knew it would. You seem to know quite a bit about it, Wheeler. Yeah. I'm in it, too. I lied along with our and Velma. It's not Will's fault. He did it because he was a friend. He didn't lie. He just... I killed Art. That's what's important, isn't it? Yes, it is, Mrs. Bolton. He was going to see her. He even told me. And I couldn't help what I did. I followed him out and shot him. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry I killed him. <laughs> Account item two, miscellaneous, $75. Expense account total, $77.30. Remarks. According to precedent, Mrs. Bolrick will probably get one of those widow's specials from three to 20 on second-degree murder. That should have her out of prison in a little over two years. So the company has that length of time to figure out ways and means to avoid payment of her claim. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Beginning next week, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will be heard on Wednesday at 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Consult your papers for the time change in your area. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Edgar Barrier, Parley Bear, Jeanette Nolan, John McIntyre, Wally Mayer, Virginia Gregg, Gene Bates, and Harry Lang. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dick Cutting inviting you to join us next Wednesday at 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. a really novel crime-busting switch. Instead of chercher la femme, it takes a femme to do the detective work on tonight's action-packed gangbusters manhunt on most of these same CBS stations. In this fast-paced gangbusters chase, it takes a lady detective to trap a shrewd safe-cracking trio when her male counterparts fail to get the evidence. And now, stay tuned for five minutes of the latest news. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.